right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. Of course, yeah, I know you don't care about me. You care about her and you care about him because this is Hanna Bear. That is Mitch Horowitz. If you've ever wanted to manifest your dreams or have your prayers answered, hello, have your prayers answered at the highest level or call pure goodness, pure goodness into your life, then do we have the daydream believer show for you? I know. Microphone. Yes, grab that mic. All right. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, of course. Today, I'll be talking with Mitch Horowitz, the Penn Award-winning historian, author, and new thought leader about his latest masterpiece, Daydream Believer, believer and how we can all wish upon a star and see our prayers answered and dreams come true. So <laughs> welcome back to the show, Mitch. Are you ready to shine? I am. Thank you. We've got <laughs> Hannah, Michael, the rooster. and Of course. Was, before we went live, I was joking with Michael that he should tell me there is there is no rooster. We, we don't know what you're talking about. You know, just oh, no. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, she's looking really serious at the moment. Yeah, very so, serious. I, you know, I, I, the first question I was going to ask is, is uh, can we wish upon a star? But you know, this this is a pure miracle here. So. Uh, I, I, you've been along this journey with me and I'm sure you know about our miscarriages and all of sorts of things. And she's going for mouse. She's saying mouse. mouse oh, a first mouse. word. Excellent. Live. <laughs> right, right, right. Actually, the first word may well be cell phone. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, see, for me, it was apple juice, but, you know, times have changed in the past 57 times years. Um, so, can... Can our prayers be answered? Are our prayers answered? Let, let's see. Where did I want to go with this? Mitch, have you ever wished upon a star? I certainly have. Uh, I write about this in several of my books. When I was a kid, uh, adolescent, maybe age 14, 15, my whole world seemed like it was falling apart around me. My folks were getting divorced. Uh, the household was just torn apart with financial disaster. We were in serious danger of losing our home. And I would walk home from a friend's house at night, I remember, and gaze up at the night sky and wish upon stars. And and I think I wrote since since any any disaster seemed possible, any solution seemed probable. And I don't I want you to it. repeat that for a second. And I know that I'm distracting you and you're doing all. an Not amazing I, job. I have two kids now adolescents themselves. So uh, believe me, I know the days. I know the days. <laughs> you, I wrote a cult said... America when my, you know, my contract for my first book, A Cult America, yeah. reached my home when our second son, Toby, who is now 16 years old, came home from the hospital. And there's this little, you know, bundle in swaddling clothes on the sofa. Yes. And a messenger comes to the house with the book contract. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be some year, you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> that's how it goes. Yeah. So, it, and it is. And wow. Yes. Uh, she, she does, she, she points to you. She also does this energy thing, which we're, we're, we're learning about. We saw Dick. blue orbs before she was born. She was born with a oh. blue orb on her her hand so there's oh. something magical and special well there's something magical and special about every child i know <laughs> that could be your sister up there i want you to repeat uh -huh. that statement something to do with if anything is improbable how, how does it go again since any disaster seemed possible any solution yes. seemed probable and i really believe that i believe it to this day yeah so can you dig more into that exact statement of there? course you know listen we all have to be mature and acknowledge that life visits catastrophes upon us. We can talk about first causes and so forth, but that's a fact. And it's a live fact that we've all experienced. But we have to also acknowledge along with that, that because tragedy and catastrophe is possible and does enter our lives through whatever cause, then the extraordinary and the miraculous is, is also possible. And in as much as anybody you walk into can tell you a story of suffering, we all have them, a person can also tell a story of just improbable good news, extraordinary good news, remarkable good news. And it happens all the time. And I think back to my, um, my intellectual hero, William James. He wrote an essay in 1895 called Is Life Worth Living? And at that time, in the mid-1890s, there was this really weird spate of suicides among young men 
in the United States. And no one knew why. It was very, very difficult to figure out. Um, the economy was going okay. Uh, people were migrating from farms, agricultural backgrounds into more urban um, business-like uh, uh, settings and city areas. And, 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 and the country at that juncture was at peace. No one could figure out what was responsible for this suicide wave, and it's still a historical mystery. And so James wrote this essay uh, to ponder the question of whether a person should succumb to despair or should should endure and keep on going. And uh, he favored uh, uh, endurance. And he, he ventured certain ideas in this essay. And one of these ideas was very, very simple. And I really want people to dig this because it's so easy to look past the simplest things as if to say, yeah, I get it. I know that already. James would say, look, no matter how great your suffering, can you stand it for 24 hours more? Can you stand it for just 24 hours more? Because in the same way that catastrophe is visited upon us, absolutely irrational, extraordinary, unforeseen good news also reaches us. And it's not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable to believe in that prospect as well and to give that prospect just 24 hours of uh, persistence, if you want to call it that, faith. And and I believe that. I believe it. I want to get into prayer. Does it work? How it works? The mechanics behind it. But you're reminding me of something I read in your book by Ralph Waldo Emerson um, about these waves or mm. frequencies. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Emerson, in, in his essay, uh, Compensation, which I reread yeah. at least once every single year, talked about the the rhythmical, pendulum-like, compensatory nature of life, that there is a mirror uh, motion for everything that we experience in life, an observation that Isaac Newton made about the cosmos themselves, that macro objects seem to mirror themselves in the cosmos. Uh, we've now learned this within within particle physics, micro objects at fantastic distances, sometimes even inconceivable distances, um, affect one another. There's a natural rhythmical quality. Emerson called it a compensatory quality uh, within our lives. And when a person suffers some defeat, some shattering disappointment, or just feeling abused or disrespected, his message was throw yourself on the side of that adversity. Don't fear it. Throw yourself on the side of that adversity because doing so puts nature in your debt and there will be some corresponding compensatory motion. That was his I view of that. life. It, it, in fact, in your book, you say, put God in your debt. And that to me is really powerful that, you know, I gave a class on automatic writing earlier today and, and somebody's saying, you know, it worked great for a while. And then all of a sudden it didn't. Yeah. And and I, I I go to the Zen truism, which is uh, if you don't have time to meditate, meditate twice as long to actually right. lean into it and the right. door will pop back open. Nature always seeks balance. What does that mean? And what does it mean to put God in your debt? Well, I really like what you just said, by the way, about that something may be working and maybe going just great. And then for some reason unknown to us, it just stops working. And and th that can be cause for despair, or it can be cause to even disavow the earlier success that a person had. And this to me links up with prayer, or whatever method one wants to use, including for that matter, wishing on stars. We, those of us who have a spiritual outlook on life, who believe in the extra physical, and I would say that probably encompasses most people in the Inspire Nation audience, those of us who 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 very deeply believe, and it's a warranted belief, that there is an extra physical dimension to life. We know it's there. We know it's real. We know it's actual. We don't know how it works. We're on our knees peeking through a keyhole, just getting these tiny, tiny glimpses in the effects in our own experience. And, and I would say we get glimpses that go beyond our experience too. In the book, I spend a lot of time writing about psychical research, ESP research, because I think that that effort is, is important too. And that effort to document the extra physical strengthens our own warranted conviction 
that there is an extra physical world. And I want to strengthen that conviction because in so doing, I think we feel its experience is more. For all that, we don't know how it works. So my message to people with respect to prayer, and we'll talk a little bit later about the mechanics of prayer and why I believe prayer does work. But my perspective on it as a practice is just keep going and going and going. Be absolutely persistent because we don't know how the other world works. And there could be that one instance where you've uttered a prayer literally hundreds and hundreds of time, times and you're past the point of despair of ever receiving. And then suddenly you receive. And we don't know why. We don't know why. But we do have those experiences in life. And I believe that they're more than just happenstance. They're certainly not what the social scientists call confirmation bias, because they can take a very long time and they can require tremendous persistence. They're not the outcome of wishful thinking. They're the outcome of a dynamic that we don't fully understand. And we may never understand. It may not be given to us to understand it, but it seems to respond to persistence. And that's a message I want to leave people with. Thank you. And I'm guessing you would say it also responds to energy. Oh, absolutely. Emotive energy, passion, focus. It's so important to know what we want. And again, it seems like such a truism to say that because so many of us, especially those of us who've been on the spiritual or the therapeutic path for a long time, we're apt to think, gee, I know what I want. I know what I want. But do we really? We must be just profoundly unembarrassed with ourselves in private about acknowledging, admitting, searching for what we want, because it's so easy, even for experienced seekers, to fall into rote thought, to fall into internalized peer pressure, to perfume our desires. We might not like all of our desires. And not every desire, not every aim, not every wish must be acted upon. The consequences might be too great. And, and that's for every individual to determine. But one must know them because energetically, emotionally, however one wants to put it, we're going to move in that direction. And to be a stranger to our most intimate wants is to be self-alienated. And, and wow, there's so many different directions I want to go here. Uh, let's, I'm going to back up for a second. You say you want to warn us not to get trapped by form in matters of prayer. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that we really get hung up, especially, and this is a, a, a particular caution that I think should be sounded with a new thought, a philosophy that I love, a philosophy that I am very deeply dedicated to. But we in new thought, just as everybody within the alternative spiritual culture as a whole, we can get caught up in these orthodoxies, these ideas about there being a right way to pray. Now, one of the things that is frequently sounded within a lot of New Thought literature is, and this is drawn from the New Testament, it has it has venerable roots, but it's this idea that you have to pray feeling that you've received. So the feeling of faith in and of itself is your is your deliverance for receipt. And I honor that and I respect that, but we can't I believe, as seekers, get into this one-track thinking where, well, gee, I guess that's the only way to pray, because there are times where the individual is going to be in grief, is going to be in anxiety, is going to be in fear. And mind you, there may be good reasons for those things. I mean, we run away from the negative as if like fear is always our enemy. It's not always our enemy. We wouldn't be innately born with it. I suppose our ancestors had to run away from saber-toothed tigers and bears, and maybe we're overwired to feel fear, but that doesn't mean it's the enemy. That doesn't mean it's something we have to eradicate. There are also times we experience fear where, in fact, our security may be endangered, or the security of someone we love may be endangered, and it may be a very reasonable response, and we may be driven to prayer during that time, but the emotions are so strong that it's impossible for us to enter that state of feeling the wish fulfilled. So does that mean the doors of the psyche are closed to us? Does that mean the royal road to prayer is closed to us? There are all kinds of examples of prayer in human history. If one wants to stay with scripture, um, there are many scriptural figures, matriarchs and patriarchs, if you want to go down that road, who 
argued uh, with the creator, who challenged the creator, who like Jonah ran away from the creator, or like Cain said, the punishment you've you've given me is too great. You have to amend it, and and the creator amended it. That's just one tradition, but but to stay with that you can find all kinds of examples. So I don't want anybody to feel that there's only one way to approach prayer. And I would also add, you don't have to approach it in a monotheistic way. I'm very, very interested in uh, a, a revival of, of pre-Judeo-Christian uh, traditions, which I write about in the book. And um, I think that's a very valid path for modern people to explore. Thank you. Well, it's 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 interesting. It's funny. I often joke about you know how um, in medieval days the angels had it better. People are like, oh my God, help me! And they actually asked for help, and then they were told, no, no, you can't ask for help. And we've gotten into this culture until recently, and new thought is bringing it back, and popular culture, fortunately, is bringing it back, where we will ask once again or a call on our angels. Where I imagine angels, guides, whomever, whatever you want to call it, are on the unemployment line. And you joke about these Egyptian gods who had jobs to do for thousands and thousands of years. Western civilization is this babyhood exactly. compared to civilization. And they're they're bummed. Right. <laughs> you talk about them being totally, what do we do? <laughs> right. I mean, even if you go by the most conventional conservative timeline, Egyptian civilization existed for more than three millennia. And that's according to the most traditional timeline. And I I, I honor the alternative theories, and, and they must be honored, that, that place I Egyptian antiquity to a much later point, because we have forensic evidence of that. Even though it's incomplete, it's there. Well, you but can let's literally go and look through portals in the pyramids at like uh, at Sirius, I think I've got it. If I've got that right, at different star alignments, yes. and you go, wait, this hasn't happened in either twelve thousand five hundred years or right. twenty procession, twenty four thousand five hundred years. Wait a second. Right, right. Wait a second, and we could do a whole show on that, and I suspect we will at one point. Yes, we very will valuable to. and very important. But even if one abides the most conservative timeline, e Egyptian civilization surpassed Western civilization by vast centuries. So the notion that there's this kind of Abrahamic monotheistic way of viewing the metaphysical, and that's just the way it is, folks, that, as you were suggesting, that's a view that almost belongs to humankind's uh, uh, kind of modern infancy. That's, that's, a, that's a view of infancy. There's a much Amnesia. older view. Amnesia, yeah. And there's a much older view in which you had this vast array of deific energies personified by our ancient ancestors who had jobs to do, who had emotions, who, who felt a, a, a wide variety of emotions, including jealousy, despair, uh, passions. They were, they were mirrors of our own psyche. And I think we can forge relations with them. And and so we can, uh, it, based on that that humanistic nature of them, we can say that they're you know pretty lonely right now. And going, why doesn't ask, uh, why doesn't anyone ask her for help? And and I would argue, hey, if there's even, I'm a kitchen sink kind of guy. Um, I, yeah. I want to try all of it and and test it and see what works. And if I can't figure out what works, well, I'm going to still use all of it. So why not? go back to, we'll call it a golden age, an age that certainly was lived a different way, at least from what is left that we can see. And why not go to them? Why not ask? And, and I guess my question for you is, if we go back to that time in antiquities, where would we start with our prayer? It's, or to whom? It's such a fascinating question. You know, <clears throat> you referenced the fact that the old gods may be lonely, which is, a, 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 I think, a, a very truthful idea and a very important idea. And, and it's not just a pretty string of words. It's much more than that. Our, our ancestors, going back to time immemorial, everywhere there's a record of human history, including the Neanderthal era, by the way. We speak of the Neanderthal era, our eldest, nearest ancestors. As, as being prehistorical, because there's no written record, but they fashioned, and we have hundreds of these figurines and statues that are Neanderthal ancestors, our most ancient ancestors, going back hundreds of thousands of years, fashioned to represent deific energies. So humanity, and even pre-humanity, pre-humanity, 
in the form of Neanderthal civilization had a spirituality that's recognizable to us today. And that spirituality personified energies that were sensed in nature and, and deified these energies and sought relationships with these energies. And it stands to reason that the existence, and I, I, I think, again, I spent a lot of time in Daydream Believer writing about evidence of the unseen world, because I think it's important to fortify our belief. And, and there are forms of evidence that come through experience and forms of evidence that come through laboratory study, and we can participate in both. So the existence of another world is a given. The wish among our most ancient ancestors, even pre-human ancestors, to get in touch with this ancient world is universal. It's universal to human history all around the globe. And if we can accept that our the ancients were instinctively right in seeking relationships with these deific energies who they felt had responsibilities for certain for the maintenance, let's say, of, of life in the broadest sense. And these energies are reflections of ourselves, as above, so below goes the hermetic dictum. Then it yeah. stands to reason that they had ethics, they had passions, they had intellects, they had feelings. And the question of these energies being lonely doesn't seem so sentimental, uh, so flowery, so metaphorical. I think it can be very literal. And I think if the individual looks to humanity's deific past and identifies through his or her own search figures that are of unique appeal, call them by whatever name you wish, Thoth, Zeus, uh, Jupiter, M Mercury, Minerva, Athena, uh, uh, any figures from anywhere around the world and seeks this relationship, I think that's a worthy spiritual experiment. I think that's a worthy philosophical experiment, and I think it's very real. Well, now, my apologies. Rue is getting nervous for some reason, so I'm going to bring him closer and see if that works. He never <laughs> likes when I discuss theology. That's always for, you know. Oh, oh wow. Well, he's really it's getting so... nervous. Let me, let me bring him over for a second and see if we can calm him down. But what, what's, what's interesting to me as you're discussing this, I know. It's Mitch. You remember <laughs> Mitch? Yes. Hi. So what's interesting is I always look at the pull on our hearts, and I want to get to science in a little bit because you, you say another world is a given. So I want to—I want your 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 best your 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 best take on this. Okay. I love to look at the pull on our heart and look at energies that are a match, like attracting like, and 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 uh, things going into synchrony or into harmony or getting into resonant frequency. And when you say if you're drawn to Minerva, if you're drawn to to Zeus. Or if you're drawn to Thoth, my belief is there's a reason for that. That pull didn't come from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. And look, we all have affinities. Everyone watching right now has his or her personal affinities. What are they? You're attracted to some things. You're repelled by other things. You know, I, I, I mean, we could... We could try to reason out why that is, why, you know, so on and so forth. But it is, you know, it is. It's a given of human nature. Why would that be different in terms of the metaphysical? Why? Why would taste, polarity, type, attraction be different in terms of the metaphysical? Thank you. So can you give us, an, and then I want to go into more of the nuts and bolts of why prayer works. Can you give us an example? You do talk a lot in this book about the science, about the parapsychology, about the everything that's being done. Like Dean Maraden is my own personal hero. What, yeah. <laughs> can you give us an example? That Absolutely. kind of case closed, another world is a given. Right. Um, I, as you were alluding in the book, I have a long chapter on parapsychology and ESP research in particular, which is something I've always been very deeply interested in. And I like the simplest, most elementary examples from ESP research, because even if the most basic stuff is, is valid, replicable, and true, and I, I, I write about this in detail in the book, and I think I demonstrate that it is in a way that would satisfy any jury, 
even the most basic findings validate the existence of another world, of an unseen extra physical world. So for example, one of the things I write about are the ESP card experiments that J.B. Ryan performed at Duke University in the early 1930s. Simple as can be. J.B. used a five- Totally repeatable and repeatable and repeatable. Thank you. So important to say that. These are replicated experiments that have been replicated dozens and dozens of times. This science was settled back in the 1940s. Now, JB used a five suit deck of cards called Zenner cards, and he just asked subjects to basically do guess hits on these cards. Your chance of getting a correct hit is one in five or 20%. He found subjects who over time and across thousands of trials and sometimes tens of thousands of trials would get hits that surpassed chance by several percentage points over and over and over again. And if you crunch those numbers together, you do find the faculty of extrasensory perception in the human experience. And as I say in the chapter, if the whole field of ESP research had stopped in the 1930s and no more experiments had ever been performed, we would have reasonable, replicable, heavily juried data that speaks to the existence of an extra physical dimension to life. And once you have that, Michael, you kind of have everything. It's a drop of water or a core sample proving the existence of everything else. If you have a cup of water, that cup of water has a source. And it's illogical to conclude otherwise. J.B. Ryan and his experiments gave us that cup of water that points to the existence of a whole other ocean or an invisible world. It's there. It's as real as 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 the words you're hearing from me right now. Excellent. Thank you. So, Rue, do you need to go to bed right now? Are you doing all right? You're very nervous. It's a little early for you to go to bed. Is it the topic? Is it the energy? What is it, my boy? I'm going to see if my energy can ground him over the next few minutes. Okay. And if not, while you're speaking, I'm going to have him head off to an early bedtime. Okay. As above, so below. What does hermeticism have to do with prayer? Well, <clears throat> hermeticism is a philosophy that grew out of the encounter between ancient Egypt and ancient Greece in what we would consider to be late antiquity, the generations immediately preceding and following the death of Christ. And it was unique and it was important because the Greeks wrote down Egyptian esoteric ideas in the expository Greek language, which is accessible to us modern people. The Egyptians communicated in symbol, geometry, oral tradition. The Greeks in expository language that we can wrap our heads around today. And one of the principles that emerged from this encounter between Greece and Egypt in, in writings that were referred to as Hermetic literature. Hermes represents our Western god of intellect, Hermes or Mercury. The Egyptian counterpart was Thoth. One of the key principles was, as you were just saying, as above, so below. There's There are correspondences to everything, including unseen correspondences to all that we experience in this physical world. We have an experience in this physical world, whatever it may be. The hermeticists would say, that's a real experience, but it's just a glacial tip of what's really going on. There's a mirror experience in the unseen, in the cosmic, in this vast ocean of extra physicality that also makes up life. And anything that's going on in this world has its mirror in the unseen. So you were saying, Michael, for example, if an individual feels him or herself attracted to an ancient god, you would say that that's not just some random attraction, but there's a real affinity there. There is something from perhaps beyond that individual that is selecting that, that attraction, that affinity, that relationship. That's an idea that's very much at home uh, in Hermeticism, that everything that we go through is mirrored in some greater dimension of life. Forgive me for asking. Are we the mirror? That's a wonderful question. And 
why wouldn't we be the mirror? You know, in the sense that we say as above, so below, there's there might be some element of life that we could roughly be considered greater than, we'll say, greater than, that might experience us as as the unseen. If we live in a world of correspondences, it stands to reason that this this chain is unknowably vast, unknowably vast. Now, I referenced particle physics earlier, and some people say, well, what do particle physics have to do with what's going on in this outer macro world? Well, what what else are we but those things that we detect as particles? You pan back the camera enough, so to speak, and our behavior, our functioning is on the particulate level. So this interconnectedness uh, captured in that very simple phrase, as above, so below, was at the heart of hermetic philosophy. Then I've got to ask, what does string theory have to do with anything? Right. String theory. (laughs) Sorry, everyone. We're going to get to why prayer works. We're getting to the bottom of all of it. The construct of the universe and the multiverse tonight. You will have it all. You'll have it all. Right. This is is a full service show this evening. Um, String theory is a conceptual model of reality that was devised by physical theorists who were trying to figure out how... How is it that all these weird things are going on? How is it that particles, for example, affect one another's electrical charge or behavior or speed at vast distances? This is true of particles. This is also true of macro objects on the larger scale of the universe. Einstein referred to it somewhat derisively as spooky action at a distance. Why should that be real? Why should that occur? And what you find within string theory is a a physical model that suggests that all of life, everything that is, exists on these undulating bands of strings. And there may be these intersections of time that we can't see, that we can't experience all the time. Maybe sometimes we get glimpses of them and we refer to these things perhaps as other dimensions. And the existence of other dimensions, other intersections of time is very much validated uh, within data emergent from quantum physics. In fact, it's a it's a logical necessity. It's a logical necessity because there are all kinds of events, infinite events in potentiality that enter our field of experience only with measurement. Well, we can't measure everything. We can't measure everything. So what's going on amid these vast infinite potentialities that we don't measure? It doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means they haven't entered our field of experience. String theory posits, in fact, they are there. They are there. And sometimes something that goes on in a different dimension or a different intersection of time affects what we experience in the here and now. And that's where these bonds of connection occur. So, for example, I was referencing the ESP experiments of J.B. Ryan. Well, how does ESP work? What's going on? Are these mental radio waves? You know, well, you know, that model doesn't really seem to hold up because because ESP occurs regardless of time, distance, space, mass. Where's the connection? And it can almost go backwards. And it can go back. Absolutely. I read about precognition in the book and retrocausality. And so string theory attempts to serve as kind of a grand theory that explains why this is going on. There is this interconnectedness as above, so below, as above, so below. In a certain sense, string theory is an attempt to physically map out the implication of that statement. Thank you. One more thing, then we'll go to prayer. I am so sorry, everybody. And I'm trying to be chill no, so the rooster doesn't get excited. You know, it's, so. it's, it's working. <laughs> We went ESP, we went parapsychology, we've gone multiple dimensions, we've got multiple universes. We need to address the little green men in the room. Oh, yeah. And and if they're here to help us. Right. Well, um, I'll, I'll, that's the tougher question. That's yeah. the tougher question. <laughs> um, the, 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 the question of extraterrestrial intelligence it coalesces with everything that we've been talking about because apropos of string theory, you have this model of different intersections of time, different dimensions. Why wouldn't we get glimpses of that once in a while? 
we receive information. It's in an anomalous fashion. So we call it ESP. We we have something, uh, we have a vision of something. It turns out to be correct. We call it precognition. But these are just words, you know, these are just words. What's really going on? It could be that we're getting glimpses all the time, albeit irregularly, of events in these other dimensions or intersections of time. So it stands to reason that the UF, what we call UFOs or UAPs or ETs or what have you, these could be interdimensional beings that we are catching glimpses of just in the same way that we catch glimpses of information out of time, so to speak. And it sounds so far out, you know, wow, come on, you guys, let's get back to affirmations. You're talking about beings from other dimensions of existence. Come on. Well, it's not that far out. It's not that far out. These things are logical imperatives if you're going to accept all the different data that we as a human community have have assembled at this point in time. And and if we're talking about um, statistics and statistical anomalies, and you talk about one person who's been struck by lightning, I don't know if he was a, 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 a ranger, a park ranger or something. Yes, that's and, right. And, 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 and you go, th- these are impossible probabilities. The probability of us being the only life in this universe that's the statistical and impossibility it's a statistical impossibility right dig this in the book i write about this park ranger a uh, virginia park ranger the man was struck by lightning uh seven times over the course of his life and this was validated by the guinness book of records and their medical records and so forth and the chances of this occurring are so infinitesimally small I mean, we barely have a number to represent it. It's one of these numbers where if it was a written page, the zeros would practically go off the page. So it's effectively impossible, but for the fact that it occurred, but for the fact that it occurred. And we encounter things like that all the time where we're told this thesis or this idea or this concept is impossible. Well, it's impossible, but for the fact that it actually is. And extraordinary events occur. They're part of our life. And they're not just attributable to to large numbers, because sometimes these extraordinary events are so profoundly personal that we can barely even find ways of representing them on an actuarial team. I had no plans on going here. You may already be familiar with this. I, I, I No plans at all. Um, I'm not sure if you know the briefest version of my NDEs, of my near-death experiences. I, so- I do not, no. So I've had two of them. April 2nd, 2006, I was gifted with a titanium femur, a titanium hip, and associated uh, hardware, you could say, loops of metal to hold it all together. Seven years, one month. And that that was from, uh, I was a, a skater sponsored by Rollerblade, uh, training to do a world record skate across the country to help students and adults with learning disabilities. And I actually just prayed for safety and guidance And a father had stepped out on the bike path right in front of me. I'd been actually, I'd been listening to the audio book, uh, Inspiration by Wayne Dyer, talking about how everything in life happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And and there you go. Seven years, one month, 17 days later, I had just, we were hiking, Jessica and I were hiking um, outside of Lake Tahoe and uh, in, in the wilderness there. I had just hugged and kissed her and told her, you know, I'm ready to have kids. This is quite a few years ago, Mitch. And then I slipped and fell in a creek and I said, oh no, not again. Hmm. Here's what's wild. Not just that there was no blood pressure when they found me, not just that it took a couple helicopters to get me out of there, that the EMTs thought I was dead, that they were freaking out. None of that. The next day I'm in the hospital. I come to after surgery. Doctor comes in and he goes, Michael, how did you do it? what? I, I've just come to, you know, I've got four or five other people's blood coursing through my veins. How did I do what? I've been unconscious here, doc. And he goes, how did you already get the x-rays up on your website? What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out the x-rays on the website faked him out and he did the surgery. I now have identical matching titanium femur titanium hip and exactly the same hardware in exactly the same place. After NDE number one, I had an inch leg length discrepancy after the balanced NDE number two, perfectly balanced. And he says, statistically, 
There are absolutely no odds of mm. exacting the exact same hardware in the exact way, same way with the exact same fractures and put back together exactly the same. Wow. And I'm wearing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And people think there's not an occult dimension of life, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's, and and we all know, have that. We we, we, we poo-poo it, but it happens to all it. of us. We poo-poo it. And, you know, I encourage, I mean, your story, your story is an extraordinary story because it hinges on life and death. But one can also find the extraordinary in more uh, quotidian experiences of life. You know, I talk in the book about searching for these pink heart-shaped buckets, which I won't go into now, but the, the the time and place and the appearance of these things, it's simply, it it it, it defies all reason, it, not just reasonable odds, Michael, I would say it defies all odds. It defies all odds. We don't have a way of, 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 of placing this uh, onto a statistical map. And that is part of life. That is part of life. And that's probably part of these glimpses that we get of the existence of this other world. I was on the Taos Pueblo years ago, Mitch. And uh, Jessica wanted us to move down to Taos for a while. And so we went down there and she's trying to convince me. And we're in the Taos Pueblo, this, this ancient uh, adobe village, uh, uh, almost like cave-like dwellings that have been there thousands of years. The only mm -hmm. place yeah. the indigenous hadn't been overrun in the U.S., and we ended up in this gentleman's shop. It was interesting. He had a platinum record on the entrance to the shop, which was a little bit odd in this, in this uh, uh, village. And we get inside and he looks us up and down. And he goes, you guys are runners, aren't you? And this, mm -hmm. is, this is a very strong, big, tall, amazing Native American gentleman. You guys are runners, aren't you? And he goes, come back here. I've got something to show you. And we go to the back and they're on a loom are uh, a pair of running moccasins. Hmm. And we had just come out with our book, Barefoot Running. And I had read this book, I think it was Native Running by a gentleman, I think by the name of Naztec. And he had talked about these moccasins. There's a black and white picture of them from like the 1930s in, in some running race. I wondered if they existed. Robert is his name, Robert Mirabal, two-time Grammy award-winning musician, holds these above his head and goes, I called you here because I live in a magical world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the world we all live in, isn't it? And as I ask you that and, and, and get your answer, Rue is going to go take a magical night's rest. So okay. he gets to say good night to everybody here. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll respond to Michael's question while he's putting the rooster to bed. Um <clears throat> Yes, we live in a magical world, and it can be a very inconsistent world as well, which is why I think that we we can't always count on certain things uh, repeating, even when they occur. And we need new and freshened methods sometimes of approaching the unknown, which is one of the reasons why I feel it's important not to get caught up in orthodoxy. You know, I mean, I think we all agree that we don't want to get into the ruts of repetitive behavior. But but why? Why? Because I think that finding water one way, one time, it's real and it's important, but it's not always going to avail us of water another time. And we mustn't allow ourselves to feel dispirited, run down, disappointed, despairing, because something that worked one time is not going to work a second time. This is why I think it is really important that we continue to come up with new methods, new means, new personal technologies, if you want to call it that, for reaching out to the to the unknown. Because it's a it's it's a very Again, we don't we know that the unknown, we know that the unseen is there, but we don't know how it works. And something that worked beautifully once may not work beautifully the second time. And we have to be willing to continually experiment and refresh in things. Thank you. Why does, why would you say prayer does work? And what are a few of the technologies that you've personally experienced that you fall back on the most? I would say that based on everything we've been discussing, 
these other energies or beings do exist and are approachable and can be petitioned and we can form relationships with them. And it doesn't contradict the mind metaphysics thesis that let's say as, as my hero Neville Goddard teaches it, yeah. all is mind, all is an outpicturing of the psyche, of the emotive thoughts, of the imagination. I think that one doesn't have to dispute that truth in order to also see reality as a as a multiplicity. The ancient Hebrews used the word Elohim to describe their conception of God as a multiplicity. As above, so below. This great multiplicity of interdimensional reality that we live within means that we can foster relationships regardless of whether all is part of one source, regardless of whether that one source is your own individual imagination. There's still a vast multiplicity of beingness. And we can, I believe, reach out to and forge relationships with beings in that other world. And I think that prayer is a way of forming a relationship. Just as in ordinary day-to-day -day life, we seek relationships. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's chemistry present, sometimes there is not. And it's important to be flexible and to move on such as circumstances require. Why would it be less so in areas of the metaphysical? We have to try, we have to try, reach out and, and follow one's affinities. You know, uh, 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 you know, as we were talking about earlier. Thank you. So I want to get into some of your personal affinities. First off, I'm going to talk about a mind blowers to the Greeks when they tripped across him, the Egyptian god Thoth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when the ancient Greeks encountered Egypt's god of intellect and writing, Thoth, uh, they applied to Thoth the honorary title uh, Hermes Trismegistus, uh, thrice greatest Hermes. They believe Thoth was three times as great as the Hellenic god Hermes or later Mercury. And it's so fascinating because Mercury, Hermes is such a basic touchstone in our, in our world. The image appears on money. Um, the root of the word commerce or merchant is in fact Mercury. And the the Greeks felt that that the Egyptian god Thoth was a kind of almost greater foundational representation of their own uh, Mercury or Hermes. Thank you. Who do you personally, if you don't mind me asking, Mitch, who or have you, let's say, who have you cultivated the greatest relationship? Or uh, I guess I can say it on you uh, on YouTube. When shit goes down, <laughs> who do you go to, Mitch? Well. There are de many different facets to my search. Um, I believe very strongly in the rebellious energies, which are yes. sometimes grouped under the term Satan or adversary, which I think has a deeper, richer, fuller esoteric meaning and than has been since understood. Since you brought that up and I was going back and forth whether to go that or not, we're going to have to blow that one out for people here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I believe. Bring him back. I got Bring that from back. my partner for Valentine's Day. A little baffle, Matt. Say hi. We had the rooster on, you know, so I feel <laughs> I feel privileged to do that. Um, you know, my contention is, and I read about this in Daydream Believer. I read about it in a recent book called Uncertain Places, that the 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 ancient Hebrew term uh, hasatan, which we in in our in English reference to Satan for the adversary, I think has been misunderstood as a force of maleficence, whereas there's an esoteric reading, which I try to make and which I write about, that describes that those adversarial forces as forces of revolution, nonconformity, protean selfhood, usurpation, exploration, radical selfhood, and I think that energy is something that has been hemmed into a very small, misunderstood niche or corner that we label evil or maleficent. And I, I think there's a deeper, richer, fuller, more esoteric reading of the satanic. And so that is part of uh, my search. 
that is part of my commitment. And those rebellious energies are something with which I seek relationship. Uh, it's not the only part of my search. In Daydream Believer, I write about the experience which began a couple of years ago of seeking a relationship with the Hellenic goddess of wisdom, Minerva, a figure who's very widely represented here in New York City, where I live. And there you, are you, you talk about chasing her all around town to all of the right. different statues and representations of her. Grand Central Terminal, Greenwood Cemetery here in Brooklyn, where I'm speaking from, not from the cemetery itself, but <laughs> it's it's nearby. That'd be interesting. We're not quite that esoteric yet. Um, and and there are many different representations of Minerva, including near near Macy's and Herald Square in Manhattan. Um, Minerva is uh, a, a figure like Mercury who looms so largely within the western experience and yet we've lost track of what she she stood for so i seek i seek a relationship uh, to that figure and there are many many different uh inquiries and, and queries that i make so is there well let's go to the story with minerva mm -hmm. let's go to what happened i think it's with your son and bicycles and minerva right, and right. going for a job right. what in the world happened and how does that correspond to prayer well, <clears throat> I felt at a certain point, and it's difficult to say why, that seeking a relationship with Minerva was something that I was drawn to explore. And I pursued this in a variety of ways. I mentioned in the book that my son and I bicycled to Grand Central Terminal and above, which is uh, um, in Midtown Manhattan. And above Grand Central, there's this beautiful tripartite statue of uh, Minerva or Athena, uh, Mercury and Hercules. And I said a prayer to Minerva, and I told him he was welcome to do so, too, if he felt like it. Anyway, he was looking for a job, and he went on a job interview, and they offered it to him on site, and he had gotten it, he got offered another job within 24 hours. And there were all these alluring, interesting things that happened. But one thing that happened uh, for me during that phase is that I was uh, shopping around a new book, and um, I had sent the book to a friend of mine who runs a publishing company in Europe. And I didn't hear back. And I was very hurt because I thought this guy is my friend and he's, you know, ghosting me here. And I was very perple perplexed and confused. And many weeks went by. Anyway, I describe it in the book. A very long, weird series of events occurred where I found out that the guy did write back to me and he wrote back affirmingly. And for some just bizarre reason, it went into a spam filter, even though I had had countless uh, email exchanges with him before where no such thing happened. And that was a direct subject, a direct subject of my prayers to Minerva. And it happened the very same day. I mean, actually within hours, within hours. Thank, thank you. I'm watching in the chat and we've got some interest. We're going to take a bunch of questions later. However, uh, first off, people are wondering who is the doll? And secondly, you you oh. you make a, a you you make a great uh, treatise. Back the doll? In, yeah. yeah, in in the book for why you don't throw out the ba the baby with the bathwater and that Satanism isn't what it appears to be. Right. And so people are saying, you're losing me here with Satanism. I was doing great up to this point, yeah. Mitch. Yeah. I'm freaking out. Well, dig this. First of all, um, <clears throat> we as an alternative spiritual community, I think, have to keep moving. We have to be dynamic. If you use the word witch in certain quarters, especially several years ago, well, go back generations, um, that would cause the same degree of freak out. And a lot of people went through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And I don't need to tell this audience that lives were lost in the witch craze that swept Europe for hundreds of hundreds of years until we could reach this point where we use the term witch today as an alternative spiritual community and everyone gets it. Everyone gets it. Now, when I use the term Satan, I'm not unaware of the buttons that that presses, and I'm not trying to press people's buttons. I am not in the business of provocation as an end to itself. What I'm saying is that my search has led me to feel that there is an esoteric interpretation of the Satanic as a force of rebellion, usurpation, personal liberty that has been misunderstood and that has been misread as a force of evil. And I write about that in Daydream Believer, and I write about that further in uncertain places. And I share this because I'm sharing my search. 
My work, my search are all the same. And that's where I am. And I share it out of honesty. This is baffle, Matt. This is just a little fun thing that I ordered. <laughs> and it has the Latin terms uh, uh, salve and coagula on his arms here, um, which means uh, uh, dissolve and bring back together. It's an alchemical formula that reflects as above, so below. Well, it, and and what it also means, so so uh, baby Hannah, uh, Hannah Bear got, got a new shirt yesterday and it says, cutest little rebel in the galaxy there you go <laughs> and, and, and what what to me that means and that represents is first off test everything mm -hmm. it means test everything and it means also as you talk about brilliantly in your book and everybody want you want to get it it is brilliant just don't expect to go through it in a day <laughs> take your time with this book or else you're gonna get whiplash it's worth it though Thank you. With that said, and you're most welcome, and, and it's most deserved, test everything means that we don't even realize where our presuppositions, where our biases, where our constructs that we're, sur that we're stuck in, where our Venn diagrams are overlapping that come from a Judeo-Christian background, right. or maybe even come from a Greek or an Egyptian. We don't even know what we know because we're stuck in all of these circles. I dig that. And one of the principles on the spiritual path is verify everything. And very often we like to pay lip service to that. And very often people will say it. And what they really mean is, well, yeah, sure, verify everything. And when you agree with exactly my perception of things, <laughs> then come back and we'll get along just fine. And, you know, I think that the search becomes dead if we succumb to parameters. It doesn't mean that you take your hands off the plow of experience, off the plow of self-responsibility. I have relationships, I have debts, and I mean that in the broadest sense. I have things that I owe to other people. It's at the foundation of life. Life is relationships. So I'm not in a in a in a headspace where I personally believe I can just throw off all fetters of debt and obligation. But at the same time, in matters of the spiritual, ethical search, in matters of the metaphysical search, it can become dead very quickly if we succumb to decisions that have been made by somebody else. And that's something I urge everybody to watch for, decisions that have been made somebody else by somebody else that we consider truisms by way of repetition, by way of cultural habit, by way of ideas that have been handed down to us that we think are compass points of reality, but are just culturally conditioned ideas. Thank you. And then I, and I'm not trying to get back to Satanism, but I'm hearing just, just some minor murmurings of discomfort here. We get to question where all of this where all of this comes from. You know, if, if we tabula rasa, I'm turning it into a verb here, if we blank slate ourselves mm -hmm. and then we open ourselves up to the world, first off, we look at it through Hannah Bear's eyes, everything is candy. Wow, this is cool, that's cool, the other thing's cool. But we don't, we we both take things as exciting and we we challenge and we test and we feel out the energy, but we also don't look at the history, we check things out for ourselves. I work very, very hard to always peel back layers of the onion and ask myself, how do I know that? Where does that come from? How can I self-verify that? Again, that doesn't liberate me from obligations that I have to row the boat that I'm in. And I row very hard. I have two kids, one of whom I'm putting through college right now, the other of whom is in high school. And... I have my debts and I have my obligations, but the search must be exquisitely free or it's nowhere or it's nowhere. And if I find an esoteric concept that I wish to probe against the grain of conventional opinion and I withhold that, I'm not being transparent about the nature of my search. And I have to push the margin because it's truth, not because I'm into pushing margins as an end to itself but because it's the truth of my search and my experience. If I do that, it may be misunderstood, but maybe it'll be understood at some point in the future. And that's what gives us the freedom today, say to reclaim a path that once upon a time was very controversial like witchcraft. And today is a basic part of the firmament of our Western world and gives people a lot of options. Just remember, 
the umbrage that people would have reacted to several decades ago, leaving aside the witch craze in Europe just several decades ago within our own culture. That umbrage is gone thanks to pioneers who were willing to actually function as pioneers to go into unknown territory. Thank you. And and I grew up, I grew up in the town of Danvers, Mass, where at the time of the Salem witch trials, it was actually a hamlet of Danvers. And one of the first, if not the first witch that was buried, um, somewhere between a quarter and a half mile from my house. So yep. I'm very familiar with this. I want to go down this road one more little bit, then I'm going to bring it back to prayer. Then we're going to open it up to questions because what I'm what I'm hearing in the chat right now, uh, forgive me if, if you're not a, able to see it. Not is seeing it, but... You don't want to play with the energy of the dark side. You don't want to touch that. I thought this was a a show or or uh, something of love and light, and I don't want to play with dark energy. Well, I would say that <clears throat> these metaphors of light and dark or higher and lower or ego versus essence uh, or eternal versus temporal. They're just words. They're just words that we form a consensus agreement around. I am interested in the darkness of the womb. I am interested in the darkness of the cosmos. I am interested in the darkness that allows us to see the stars and the planets in the night sky. I am interested in the darkness that is the primordial mud depths, ocean depths from which life emerges. We have to talk in terms of conduct, not in terms of metaphors. You know, darkness is just a metaphor. It might mean something different to me than it does to my neighbor. I need to talk in terms of conduct and to be very, very specific about that. Thank you. And and if we look at the universe, what we're understanding, and you can throw it on a scale, dark is there's far more dark matter than there is light. And that's the glue, the unseen stuff that holds everything together and allows us to sing, see and bring and to see, be and bring forth the light. All right. I'm going to switch gears. There are a few more questions on prayers. Then let's open this up. Are you doing all right on time, Mitch? Okay. Are you having fun, Mitch? I am. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I am having fun too. I have called this a bromance before we got started right, and right, I can right, see right, why right. I'm loving this. <laughs> all right. What's the danger of answered prayers or the invisible protection in unanswered prayers? Well, one of the things I've really pondered is what is protecting me in terms of <clears throat> unanswered prayers? I have prayed for things, wanted things, yearned for a certain career choice, yearned for a certain relationship. And I have realized later, and this is not some figure of speech or, or some rationalization, I have realized later that if I have, had I gotten what I wanted, it would have been absolutely disastrous. And I felt that there was some kind of protection in an unanswered prayer. And I was very moved by that because skeptics will sometimes say, the problem with you spiritual people is that you pray for something, you get it, and you think it's magical, but you don't think of all the times where you prayed and you didn't receive something. Well, I dispute that because I think everybody listening to us right now could think of circumstances, maybe some of the most meaningful circumstances in their spiritual life, where they didn't receive the object of their prayers, and they felt absolutely relieved, protected, and rescued by having not received. And that's a very great mystery to me. And I'm trying to work with that. That's part of my search right now. I'm trying to work with what does it mean to have a prayer go unanswered? And can that be equally miraculous to actually receiving? Because it has in my life been such. Before my first MDE, I skated down this bike path. I had a good old jolly good time. I took off my skates. I put my feet in a mountain creek, Boulder Creek in Boulder, Colorado. And there I prayed and meditated for safety and guidance for my upcoming journey. Safety mm -hmm. and guidance was my prayer specifically. I laced up my skates. I said, go slow. And I was a, 
sponsored by rollerblader. I was a darn good skater. Mm. I said, go lace them up, go slow, Michael. It's a Sunday. Tourists are waking up. There'll be tourists out. Take your time. And I rounded that first bend. And you could say, I almost died. Or for a brief moment, I did die. And yeah. I was broken into many pieces. Uh -huh. Was that a prayer that went unanswered? Or was that perfect, a perfect answer, which I would argue it was, a perfect answer in a different form than what I expected, which brings us full circle when it comes to getting hung up on form. Right, right. Well, I have to respond to that uh, in the words Please of do. my my <laughs> my recently deceased friend, uh, Jacob Needleman, who was a great spiritual philosopher who we lost just several months ago. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that was one of the answers I almost I always valued from from Jerry Needleman. I mean, one one doesn't know, you know, there's there's I think that there I, I think that as you've described it, there's tremendous meaning there. There's tremendous meaning there. Now, we speak in terms of life always being purposeful. I'm not sure about that. I, I mean, we live under many dynamic laws and forces. There are so many different laws and forces in life. And we here in the United States, just speaking for myself, we live in a situation, for example, where most of the time our physical safety, our physical sustenance is reasonably guaranteed. But I'm looking at the nation of Sudan right now, which is being torn apart by a civil war, and completely innocent people are losing their lives, their safety, safe access to drinking water, just basic things uh, that, 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 that you know, we don't even think about. And that's not because the Sudanese public has done anything wrong. There are forces at work in that society, economic and military forces, that are tearing it apart. And I think we, we have to remember to be very mindful of that. There are catastrophes going on around the world where people may be getting subjected to things that arise from various material laws and forces uh, that are not necessarily um, meaningful you know, in, in their lives uh, and, that, and that require desperate uh, navigation. Thank you. A couple more questions on prayer. Then let's let's open it up here. You you mentioned prayer opens the fold of the psyche where you already have the answer. What does that mean? I've often thought about this, Michael. You know, we sometimes we're desperate to know: Will such and such a thing happen to me? Is such a relationship right? Is such a career path possible? Am I going to find a solution or a way out of this thing? And we might approach a divinatory method like tarot. We might approach somebody who's a psychic or, or a channeler. We might pray. And I think all those things are valid and all those things have objective worth to them. But I would also say that very frequently we know the answer. Very, very frequently we know the answer and we're, we sort of defer to some other source, which is not wrong because that other source may have something worthwhile to offer, but we very frequently know the answer, but we're kind of afraid to acknowledge it or we don't want to acknowledge it. Sometimes the very way that we frame the question, like, will I be in jeopardy if I do X? Well, look, if you have to ask yourself that question, the great likelihood is that you have a pretty good instinct that, yes, that might place you in jeopardy. Listen to that. Listen to that. Well, thank you. And since we're talking about instinct, I want to talk about urgency. I want to talk about half measures. I want to talk about from the Kabbalion, rhythm compensates. What's going on here and how important is it when you know what you need, when you know what you have to do yeah. to throw all of your energy toward it? Right. See... <laughs> funny you use the kitchen sink metaphor earlier i have to start using that metaphor i use the d-day metaphor and <laughs> had a german translator the other day say to me could we find another term than d-day i don't think point. That, it's not going to go over <laughs> well with my readership <laughs> we can talk about that um but the fact is i i do believe that if if a person has an objective that's profoundly important it, it why not throw everything at it every possible source and capacity uh, at this objective. So for example, if an individual is experiencing an illness or a physical malady, I don't think anything is exclusive. 
prayer, alternative therapies, mainstream therapies, allopathic medicine, energy medicine, meditation, everything, everything, everything. Because we don't know where our deliverance may be found. And it seems to me that we live in a very dynamic world. Things reach us in unexpected ways all the time. Wallace D. Waddles, who wrote The Science of Getting Rich, made a point that I've always loved. He said, you know, the greatest likelihood is that your solution is going to reach you through an established channel. So something is not just going to spring up out of the ground, but it'll reach you through a, a path that has already been tread, so to speak. But or we else you won't notice it. You may not notice it because it may seem so routine or it may seem outside of one's orthodoxies. Another reason to be really, really careful about orthodoxies. There might be a person who views mainstream medicine suspiciously, but the very thing they need could come through mainstream medicine and vice versa and vice versa. So we have to be flexible enough to allow those established channels to reach us. And one means of flexibility, as you were saying, is use everything, use everything. Thank you. In using everything and going back to prayer, how does prayer change our consciousness or change our attitude? Or, oh, I think you have something. I think you have a special tattoo on your arm. Something minds. What are the minds? I must yeah. have it here somewhere. <laughs> what, um, Positive PMA. Oh, my oh, PMA, God. Right, what right. does prayer have to do with PMA? Right. And how <laughs> does prayer change our mind? You know, it's funny. Um, this symbol, by the way, is from a, the punk, you know this, the punk band yeah. uh, Bad Brains. And I was always very turned on by that band. Uh, they came out of Washington, D.C. Because we think of, you know, phrases like PMA, positive mental attitude, it can sound a little too squeaky clean sometimes. But one of the the the, the guiding lights of that band, whose name is HR for Human Rights, he discovered Think and Grow Rich PMA when he was 16 years old. And he felt very strongly that it saved him from a life of drugs. It saved him from a life of really descending into street crime, which was a very strong temptation when he was a kid. And what's fascinating about cultivating a positive mental attitude is that it can take you in any direction you want. It doesn't have to be this monochromatic way of life. Like I'm going to foment a positive mental attitude so I can, you know, have the house by the beach or whatever. That's a perfectly fine goal, but an individual might have a radically different goal. And a positive mental attitude, PMA and prayer can serve anything. It can serve any sense of radical selfhood. And I don't want us as an alternative spiritual culture to get too comfortable with the ideas of what represents a legit goal or what does not. I've had the experience of sometimes entering a certain social situation and thinking, I don't like the vibes here. This is too uh, conventional or it's too mainstream. And I stop myself and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That dude driving the Volvo or the golf cart and wearing the polo shirt has no less an authentic existence than I do. No less an authentic existence. And if I'm reacting against him, that's me being prejudiced. And I really try to capture myself with that stuff. I finished an interview yesterday, two days ago. It's been a long week. And we're at Thursday, Mitch, with uh, uh, Michael Beckwith, Reverend Michael Beckwith. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the line that we ended with is, and I can't remember if it's Easy e or who it was, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and and to me, in a sense, that means, hey, wait, before you go judging anybody else, check in with yourself Absolutely. first. Absolutely. And Michael, I'm 57 years old, and it has helped me be so much more relaxed and lead a better life. I, I think that we all suffer from these you know, prejudices towards others. And, and we get into these grooves of orthodoxies, even as we seek to flee orthodoxies. I write about an experience in, in the book where I was vacationing at this eco lodge in the nation of Belize. And we changed hotels at one point, and we went to this very mainstream beach resort. And that's when I felt all of this kind of prejudicial opposition rising up within me. And I thought, you know, what am I? What am I if that's the affinity that I succumb to, that I give into? 
Thank you. So I'm going to jump into some questions here, and and uh, the chat is going hot and heavy. So I'm going to it's going to be interesting to see where the questions are. I'm going to take them in in order here as best I can. See where we get to. Um, from Jive, Jive Cat, yeah, take all all the water you need there. Uh, from Jive Cat, the magnificent. I've experimented with prayer to Thoth after a suggestion from Mitch in his talk about the Kabbalion. Does he also work with Thoth? And what does he think about other hermetics, uh, hermeticists like Franz Barden? Oh, I, I have worked with Thoth. I have worked with Mercury. I've, I've worked with those energies. Um, I haven't done that recently, but I think it's a very powerful, very wonderful form of energy um, to work with. I, uh, it's the energy of communication. It's the energy of writing. It's the energy of intellect. It's the energy of commerce. Um, astrologically, for those people who are into Western astrology, tomorrow we're entering the cycle of so-called Mercury retrograde, where everything is supposed to go kablooey. But I would say, dig this, dig this. If Mercury retrograde represents a backwards moving force of that energy of communication, of commerce and so forth, one also has to accept that that can be helpful too, because it can undo knots. We might have knots in our lives, like relationships that 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 got that got caught up in in problems and conflicts, and those things could be undone during Mercury retrograde. So yes, there's going to be the usual annoyances that we associate with Mercury retrograde, such as life. But there can also be wonderful things, such as people coming back from your past who you might need to reconcile with. So I think this could be a really special time to work with the energy of Mercury. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. You're going to mm -hmm. be taking a step backwards, but that doesn't mean it's not for your highest good. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Next question from uh, Sylvia. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, a question about what Jesus said, that what I can do, you can do much more to both Mitch and Michael. So I'll have you go there first and I'll see if I have anything to add to it. All that, I think the, what is the exact quote? All that you can do, uh, all that I can do and more you can, I, I'm butchering it. Well, it's, it's, it's a beautiful expression. And I think that that, within that expression, we hear, it seems to me, the echoes of the Egyptian as above, so below, the echoes of correspondences that the possibilities for the individual are mirrored are are mirrored on what might be called a greater plane of life and these things are real they are actual if extraordinary thank you from information gatherer and I, this one i'm struggling to read so let's we'll, we'll go through this together and 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 i would i would say <clears throat> that that jesus was a wayfarer he held the light and he showed us the way he's not saying i am the way I can only carry you so far. You can take it to the next step and to the next step and to the next step, whether that's above, whether that's below, whether that's outside, whether that's inside. Information gatherer. I've had int intuitive guidance, but when overwrought or in a very difficult position to respond, which is the point of guidance, how do I then deal with the consequences which when causing or when causes harm, how do I deal with the consequences when the consequences cause harm? A very heavy question. Everything in life is consequential. I mean, we could sit in our house and just watch cartoons all day and, and we would suffer wildly unforeseen consequences. Everything is consequential. Um, it can't be avoided. And I think that a consequence may come in the form of death. Um, there's a wonderful passage in the Talmud where a master asks his students, uh, what's the mark of an evil man? And all the students give good answers, but one student says, he who borrows and does not repay. And the master says, I approve your words because the words of everyone else are enfolded in your words. He who borrows and does not repay. So we all have debts. <laughs> they might be debts to ancestors. They might be debts to kids. They might be debts to our significant other. It might be debts to our employer. You know, it has to be broadly defined. They might be debts to the search. You know, so I do think that the individual must endeavor to pay his or her debts. If I have a guiding ethic in life, at least as an ideal, it's reciprocity. And so 
everything that you or I do is going to bring with it consequence, is going to bring with it debt. Now, sometimes it seems to me we can pay that debt beforehand. Uh, there may be, and this touches on the question of rhythmical cycles, compensation that Michael and I were talking about earlier. Sometimes I get called upon to do things that I desperately do not want to do, tasks, chores that I regard as 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 hugely unappealing. But I try to think of it, I try to think of it as a possible payment a forethought, a possible payment beforehand. I've had circumstances where, for example, I've been in terrible relationships and then found myself in wonderful relationships, and I've wondered if the prior events were a kind of payment. Sometimes I think we have to make the effort to see those things in our lives, and that might be a way, might be a way of paying for debt or consequence um, as a uh, a for action. Thank you. And there's one word. If there's one word that I know that Mitch lives by, and 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 this this chat has been fascinating here tonight, Mitch. But the word that you live by is character. Character. Yeah, yeah. And I think we should be willing to talk about character, honor loyalty i think these primal ethics are things that that we we have lost and that maybe we associate with corruption uh, loyalty is not the same thing as corruption it's a kind of solidarity and i think we should we should revisit some of these primal ethics thank you from elaine from elaine brown do angels guides and other divine beings communicate with each other I would I would assume so. Uh, again, uh, if there's an interconnectedness of life, I would think that 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 just as we communicate with one another, I would think the uh, beings that we cannot always see uh, communicate with one another. It seems to me there's a a grand interconnectedness. That that would be my my leap of faith, at least. Thank you. There's uh, I, I want to take some of these in order. However, I, a really fun one can, just came in from I think it was a uh, B G. Uh, what does Mitch's shirt say? Oh, this says Divinity. Uh, this is a shirt I got at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, there's a, a director named Eddie Alcazar who uh, made a movie, which is going to be coming out in theaters in a few months, called Divinity. It's a fascinating movie. It's a it's a it's a science fiction story that takes place in the future where um, Earth's population, for various reasons, has been greatly reduced. And, and most people on Earth are no longer capable of conceiving children. But a scientist has come up with a formula uh, where you can be eternally young and beautiful. And so the population is divided between those who want to find ways of conceiving children and perpetuate the human race versus those who are just down with um, um, experiencing beauty and eternal life. And so the question is, you know, do you want to be beautiful or do you want to be generative? And of course, everybody jumps to the answer. Well, I want to be generative. I'm one of the good guys. And it's, well, be careful, be careful. You know, the film really challenges that thesis and asks you where you come down. It's a very beautiful movie. Anyway, they were giving out this T-shirt and that's where it comes from. Oh, I, I've, got, I've got to jump in there, Mitch. <laughs> so where, where do you come down on this? And and what what does that mean for um, you know, there's, 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 there's such, I want to become enlightened and then I don't have to come right. back here. There's the, where do you fall on all of this? Well, my impression at this point in my search is that the greatest avenue for me in life has been self-expression. And it seems to me that we are all desirous of being expressive, expressive, and that can take many different forms that can take the form of Having kids that can make the take the form of producing a beautiful work of art that can take the form of 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 some sort of of, of any number of things. I, I mean, I'll I'll I could spin out example after example, but people get the point. That self expressiveness, it seems to me, is the core drive of life. Is the core drive of life. I would even say the purpose of life. So I love the movie. I'm not sure that I'd be willing to answer the question within the boundaries that the director framed it. The movie is brilliant and the director is wonderful. And I think everybody should see it. I'm not sure that I would respond to life within the framework that the movie sets up, but it's a great challenge and it's worth seeing. Very cool. Next yeah. question is about art from X SK Abstract Art. And and I, I once worked with a... Um, uh, a, a very well-known artist who would actually take and write prayers 
and put the prayers inside of his art, inside of the medium that he was using. And SK Abstract's art's question is, can you talk some ideas about how to put prayers maybe into art? I think of Hilma Hilma F. Clint and her work in the 1900s, how powerful it was. And I'm not familiar who that was, so maybe you can... uh, uh, enlighten us. Oh, she, well, Hilma Afklin, <clears throat> excuse me, was a painter who was very inspired. She was part of theosophy. She was very deeply inspired by the ideas of Madame Blavatsky and other concepts that ran through theosophy. Brilliant, brilliant visionary artist. I, I think that that it's, I would say that our expression of ourselves as greater beings appears in everything that, that we do. You know, Helma Afklin was an abstract artist who sought to capture images of the other world uh, within her art. But I would say it's it's true for everything and, and everyone and whatever we do. If we're generative beings, look, Western scripture says uh, God created man in his own image. I think that's just another iteration of as above, so below. If we take that seriously, and, and I think that one can find the profoundest truths about human nature in all religious expressions and all ethical expressions and all therapeutic expressions going back to antiquity up through the present. If we take seriously the notion that that which creates fashioned us in its image, not my way of putting it, but a valid way of putting it, um, it stands to reason that we're here to create and that it, it, it follows that this appears in everything that we do. Good and bad. In many ways, isn't that the energy of the universe itself? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were asking before about the little green men thesis. Are they here to help us? Well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> look at human beings. I mean, w- why would they differ terribly from human beings? Do we help each other? We like the vanity of thinking that we do. But when we actually get down to business, uh, who are we? You know, so before asking who are they, it's best to ask, who am I, yeah. and who am I helping, and who am I not? Yeah. And the best way for me to probe that question is through my relationships. I, I am hopeful that when the little green men visit, and and, and I use that term, uh, you know, tongue in cheek. They're they're, they're yeah, very yeah, beautiful species who who have visited us. I'm I'm sure of this. Um, I would like to think that any species that has made it through their own version of a nuclear era, whatever that means, and has gotten to the other side of blowing themselves apart has a greater, well, I, I like to think of humanity, for instance, I'm going to take it back to humanity, where I do see us at a global reset at a time where we are shifting in consciousness. And I do believe we will get to a level where that is not the status quo of do unto others before they do unto us. And I would like to think that those little green men have already crossed the barrier to a version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 that we're uh, challenged with getting to at the moment. Knock wood, you know, <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. You know, I, I, I look at the, um, I guess I try to look at my, you know, I, I look at the human species and um, the complexities in human nature, the frictions in human nature, the certainty uh, on the part of every individual that he or she is doing good in the world. I've never met anyone who doubts that about it's him true. or herself. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, we have to be really careful of those blind spots. I do. You know? Yeah. So uh, uh, another brilliant question from Jive Cat the Magnificent. Could Mitch kindly talk about what differentiates his anarchic magic from the chaos magic? And we're going to have to bring this down for people here. Um, for those of us who aren't as familiar <laughs> There's a reader. with all of it. There's a reader. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the anarchic magic from the chaos magic of Peter Carroll and, and the illuminates of Thanateros. And I don't know what I just said. Well, you I must nailed admit. it. <laughs> you nailed it. You nailed it. Okay. Look, chaos magic is a is a is a form of magic that that became popular and is popular in the late twentieth, early twenty first century. That has to do with um, a kind of using different forms of ceremony in in very free flowing ways. And I have a form of magic called anarchic magic, which is similar to that. And anarchic magic is a grand, beautiful pastiche of of everything. I mean, everything that we've talked about tonight. This. This conversation is a treatise in anarchic magic. It's 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 using everything. I think that we as mature beings are capable of that. 
we as as a human community have been doing it across history. People complain sometimes about cafeteria religion. Every religion is the result of cafeteria religion, so-called. We have been mixing and matching religions since the era of our, our Neanderthal ancestors hundreds of thousands of years ago. And that is a fact of human existence. So to accept that, to embrace that, to work with that in the here and now is my definition of anarchic magic. It's very close in nature to chaos magic. I'd say if there's any difference at all, really, some people who practice chaos magic believe, I guess they do it from a psychological perspective. They don't necessarily have a spiritual or extra physical perspective. My perspective is definitely spiritual, definitely extra physical. And that's an aspect of anarchic magic for me. Um, so that's my definition of, uh, of my path. Thank you. From Griselda Triple X. I have friends who say I visit them in their dreams and we are dressed up and laughing. I also have flying dreams. Mitch, do we visit others in dreams? I would think we almost have to. I mean, if one believes in the ESP thesis, which we were talking about earlier in the show, um, that thesis is equally active in our dream state. And if we're participating in an exchange of information in a kind of relationship in periods of ESP, it's possible that the dream state facilitates that even more. So yeah, I think that's very real, very real. Thank you. Couple more questions here. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, I want everybody to be able to get your book. So I want to send people where they can do that. From uh, Amy. Holy Spirit is part of the trine, or the, yeah, I guess you'd pronounce it trine, but can Holy Spirit also be considered an angel? Wow, it's a very interesting question. Yeah. I would say that there's an aspect of each and all. There's an aspect of each and all. So I don't think we have to draw sharp lines between what is and isn't uh, spirit, uh, what is and isn't an expression of the greater. Uh, I, I think that we mustn't get overly hung up with feeling that there's this sharp line of demarcation here. You know, a friend of mine used to say, we talk about personality versus essence. And very often what we mean is if I do something and I like it, that must be essence. If I don't like it, it must be personality. And, you know, he meant that in a joking way, but I, in my outlook, I try to dispense with all these supposed dichotomies. How would we know where one begins and one, one ends? You know, where does infinite spirit begin and end? Is there really a line of demarcation there? So I would answer in the affirmative to your question, because it seems to me that each is in all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From uh, Bellatrix628, which one of Mitch's books should one read first? Wow. Well, I'm very proud of Daydream Believer. I think if you read Daydream Believer, you kind of get everything. Um, there's lots of other books I, I'm, out I'm there. I'm going to pause you there for a second. Because mm -hmm. Daydream Believer, to me, is, is a treatise <clears throat> of... Mitch understanding Mitch. <laughs> That's really what it is. Who am I? What do I study? What have I learned? Where am I going? All of it is in there. It's Mitch. That's what Daydream Believer is. Yeah. Well, I can't imagine that my existence or anybody's existence is wholly unique. So if, 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 if we probe I mean this one in the best slide. of ways. No, I appreciate Mitch. that. I appreciate that. I'm laughing because uh, I have a book called The Miracle Month, which is like a 30-day plan. And somebody wrote a slightly tongue-in-cheek review of the book and said on Amazon and said, you know, this is basically how to be more like Mitch. And I was like, well, I didn't really mean it that way. But what I'm trying to drive at is that we all share a common existence. I can't imagine that my experiences are just exclusive to me. So if I probe something, I hope it has applicability, I assume it has applicability uh, to my neighbor. Um, and uh, Daydream, but as you said, yeah, I mean, it's a real catalog of my experiences, which hopefully uh, have applicability to everyone's search and needs. Um, I have another more recent book out called Uncertain Places, which is a collection of essays. I'm proud of that, too. I'm working on a new book right now called Modern Occultism, which is more of a straightforward historical book, as I also write as a historian, and it's a history of the occult from late antiquity up through today. So that's a very epic undertaking, um, but I'm proud of Daydream Believer, and I, I recommend that one as a starting point. So because the chat has been so 
active, shall we say tonight, would yeah. you mind giving a definition so that we don't freak people out <laughs> about what a cult means? Oh, sure. I mean, a cult just is a, 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 a Latin term. It comes from the Latin occultus or occulta for hidden or unseen. That's all it means. It, it, it traversed into the English a language as a cult in the early 1500s, it was a term that Renaissance thinkers used to refer to uh, the spirituality of the ancient world, spirituality of Greece, Rome, Egypt, Persia, that had vanished during what we sometimes call the Dark Ages. And they were trying to re-encounter this spirituality, the spirituality of the so-called pagan world, the Egyptian world, and so on. And they refer to it as a cult, unseen or hidden, which it was to them because its traditions had vanished. So occultism is, is a revival, is a continuation of that, that effort to probe some of humanity's most ancient spiritual forms. Thank you. And then what does love mean to you, Mitch? What a wonderful question. That's a heavy question. What does love mean to me? Um I think it means the wish to sustain something or someone, the wish to sustain something. Uh, if if I feel I, I love for my children, if I feel love for my partner, uh, my wish is to sustain their existence. Sustaining their existence uh, is something that 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 is absolutely foremost in in my motives. So if 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 we see ourselves as as creatures who feel love for another then then that comes with the absolute wish to sustain their existence if we see our, feel ourselves the recipients of love then we're the recipients of that wish from another so that's what it means to me thank you thank you thank you where can people go mitch to find your beautiful beautiful book and to find out more and and Everyone, there is something you're going to take away in this book, something that you didn't understand. And and just as this has been a challenging chat for many people, it, it is going to be a beautiful gift and opportunity to challenge our assumptions and to challenge um, what has been put on us or programmed into us, like with baby Hana. We're very careful. I'm going to go back. We're going to get to where to get your book, but I'm going to go back real briefly to Don Miguel Ruiz and, and Don Miguel Ruiz and, and his son, who I also had on, well, he has uh, several sons, but uh, his, his son, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., who's one of my first guests, they both have said the same thing. You either domesticate your children yourselves or someone else will domesticate <laughs> them, mm -hmm. which means we are all a product of everything that we've been taught by the generations gone by and they've been taught by their generations and they've been taught by their generations. And to me, the ultimate rebel is someone who starts to pull on the strings and discover what is truly real to you. And I believe this book does an amazing job, not just to pulling on the strings, but helping you to pull on your own strings. And to me, that sets you free. That's beautifully put. Thank you. I think that's really so, beautifully put. Where can people go to find your beautiful <laughs> book, Daydream Believer? Well, you can find Daydream Believer anywhere you buy books. Uh, there's a struggling little startup called Amazon or, you know, any place else <laughs> that you wish to go. Um, you can find me at uh, my website is MitchHorowitz.com. Um, I'm on social media on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz. I just lost my blue check. Thank you, Elon Musk. Um, I'm on Instagram. You are uh, no longer verified, Mitch. That's right. That's right. Well, it's so it's great now because it just throws everything open. Like suddenly Mick Jagger no longer has a blue check. Like this is very interesting, you know? And, um, anyway, uh, I'm on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz. I'm on Instagram at Mitch Horowitz 23. Uh, those are great ways to stay in touch, uh, to stay abreast of what I have coming out. Um, and again, all the books, you know, Daydream Believer and everything else is available anywhere you buy your books. It's in audio. I narrate it digital, physical. Thank you. I was going to ask you any last words of wisdom and certainly feel free to go there. But since you mentioned Mick Jagger, I had an early question that we never got to. What can you tell us about Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Rolling Stones? I can't get no satisfaction. Oh, <laughs> well... 
that that's a curveball. I, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that one. Um, <clears throat> Ralph Waldo Emerson, The Rolling Stones, and I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Um, I would say, first of all, that uh, chemistry and relationships matter above all else in life. Uh, wherever you find your relationships, wherever you find your satisfaction, cultivate it. Be very, very careful about it and run away from the opposite. Get away from cruel people. If there are people who don't get you, don't understand you, uh, let me tell you, we are bound by these tendrils of convention, feeling that we have to be around people who drain our energies in life. And we don't test those boundaries. And once you test them, you'll find that they are a lot more permeable than you might have been brought up to believe. And uh, you should only place yourself in the company of people who are nurturing to you and be absolutely adamant about it. Thank you. I've got a crazy question for you. And this question has actually come up before tonight from a comment that came to me from somebody very serious about it a year or two ago who was very upset, forgive me, Mitch, very upset for having you on the show. Mm -hmm. So since this is an open forum and, and I'm very respectful, forgive me for asking this. Shay Lake asks, uh, and I can't believe I'm going to go here. So I'm saying this with all love. Hey, Michael, can you ask Mitch if he sacrifices innocence to his rebellious gods, please? Uh, I sacrifice conventions. I think we all get to do that, Mitch. And I might also add, I'm glad there's people who don't want me on the show. Let your goodness have some edge to it, else it be none, Emerson wrote. I think if there weren't people who were unwilling to judge me, then I would be reciting anodyne truisms, anodyne truisms, and I would be upsetting nothing and pushing the margin nowhere. So if there weren't people who didn't want to hear from me, then I wouldn't be producing any actual friction, any light. I wouldn't be creating anything. I'd just be reciting. Amen to that, my brother. And that's what I've been doing this year for people who say the show is different. The show is different because in the most beautiful way, I have cared less about how I've seen by others and just brought me Mm -hmm. And if you like me and love me, I'm going to cry now. If you like me and love me, awesome. If you don't like me and love me, awesome. Find that one who do you do like and love exactly. Maybe yourself first. Exactly. N nobody has to partake of well water from any well they don't want to drink from. And, uh, and we ought to protect that too. And we ought to not take that for granted because we live in a time and a place where we're able to be seekers. And uh, I think our, 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 our debt uh, to those who have allowed this time and place to emerge where we're able to be seekers is to truly search and develop ourselves to the fullest in that regard. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank Mitch. You. We have th and thank you for your patience. We I'm looking at the time and I'm going, oh my God. Yeah. Um I think I gotta this get is my kids home. I, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the texts are going to be flying. We have a rule in the house. You have to be home before tomorrow's horoscopes are out. I, and, that's the oh um, <laughs> that's the uh, that's the that's the curfew rule. You know, if the horoscopes are out and you're not home, you're in trouble. So. OK, well, let's get you going there for everyone out here. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone out here. I don't even know how to wrap this thing up. Have fun. Be well. Check out Daydream Believer and everything Mitch has to offer. Of course, get the Daily Woohoo at DailyWoohoo.com. And I really <laughs> want you. I want you to be your own galactic rebel and check everything, check everything in here, accept nothing, and then pray like your life depends on it because it does. Right on. Love, Great to be man. with you, man. Just Wonderful. love, just Thank love, you. just love. All right. See you all next time. Next up, my friend Mitch Horowitz. Mitch is a historian of alternative spirituality and one of today's most literate voices of esoterica, mysticism, and the occult. He worked in, uh, for many years in publishing, including as a vice president at uh, Penguin Random House, where he was editor-in-chief at Tarcher, where I used to work. Um, Mitch is a writer in residence at the New York Public Library and the award-winning author of four books, including The Miracle Habits, and my favorite, Occult America. Uh, he's here today 
to tell us about ESP. Like many of you, I'm really delighted to be here. This has been such an extraordinary two days. The intellectual quality of the exchanges have just been remarkable. And like many of you, I'm really struck by the conviviality of all the participants. And I think that that is a direct reflection of the event's organizers. So I'd like to give a hand to them, please. The name of my brief presentation this morning is ESP Case Closed. ESP exists. If you've been reading Wikipedia lately, you have great cause to doubt me. In fact, if you've been reading any of the mainstream literature around ESP research or the first five or 10 results that come up on any average Google search, and you're a journalist writing on deadline, or you are a grant-making executive at a foundation, or you are an ambitious graduate student deciding how to chart out your career in the social sciences, you have every reason to believe that that contention is completely subjective, shaky, woo-woo, dangerous, and not to be taken seriously intellectually which is why it's a wonderful topic for us to consider here at Hereticon. The great Enlightenment philosopher David Hume had a very simple formula by which to judge the validity of miracles, of things that seem to violate all common observation or natural law. And his formula was this, the countervailing arguments had to be more fantastic than the miraculous claims themselves. That if the skeptics or the critics or the disputatious voices were venturing arguments that required a more extreme leap of faith or credulity than the events, the events began to win out in terms of the weight of rationality. That, I contend, is exactly the place that our culture is in right now in the 21st century with regard to ESP research. And to illustrate that, I want to highlight three significant chapters in academically based, clinically based ESP research in this country, going back to the 1930s. These are not the only chapters. My colleague, John Valentino, who has done wonderful work at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, is going to talk about another chapter as well, following me. But let me stick with these three major milestones. The first goes back to the early 1930s, when a brilliant scientist, psychologist, trained botanist, and statistician named J.B. Rhine, who is an intellectual hero to me, founded the Parapsychology Lab at Duke University around 1930. J.B. was very interested in, dev in devising simple, repeatable methods that could test for... Every day there's a new horizon Birds keep on singing, earth keeps on spinning Time to toss any fears they rule you Dance to vibrations, no limitations 